Hello everybody and welcome. We are from Pantheon and today we are going to present to you on Private Equity and Pantheon International PLC or PIP for short, which is the investment trust that's advised and managed by us. My name is Vicky Bradley and I look after the investor relations for PIP. I'm joined by Helen Steers, who is a partner at Pantheon and is the lead manager for PIP. And we are also joined by Tanu Cheetah, who is a principal in Pantheon's investment team and is responsible for managing PIP's investment activities. During this presentation, we are going to give an update on the private equity market, what we think private equity offers to investors and how they can access it through PIP. And we will also talk about the impact of COVID-19 and the outlook. We do welcome your questions, so please submit them and we will answer them at the end of the presentation. You can do this by submitting a question in the ask a question box, which is underneath the speaker photos and to the left of the presentation slides. Before I hand over to Helen, I'll kick off with a quick introduction to Pantheon for those of you who may be less familiar with who we are and, and what we do. Pantheon, which advises and manages PIP, was formed in 1982, so has been around for nearly four decades. We started out in London, and that's where our headquarters are, and we have grown into a global business with eight offices spread across the Americas and Asia. We have more than 300 staff based in the regions, and we manage over $50 billion of assets for more than 600 clients, one of which is PIP. Pantheon started life as a private equity firm, and that accounts for the majority of our assets under management, but we also manage strategies across infrastructure and private debt. Over many years in the business, we have built up scale and significant expertise, and that's critical as our role on behalf of our clients is to seek out the best private equity firms globally and invest in their funds or directly into businesses alongside them. It's not easy to access the best private equity deals as you need to have deep, long-standing relationships and access to information that others don't have. Our large team of investment professionals and our position on over 450 advisory boards gives us just that. And our many years in the business means that we have managed assets through multiple economic cycles. As a client of Pantheon, PIP has access to this vast platform and experience. So on to PIP. PIP has been around for a while as well. It's IPO'd in 1987 with 12 million pounds and has grown to become a FTSE 250 company with net assets of 1.6 billion pounds. Our financial year end is 31st of May. So the numbers you can see here are as at the end of May and therefore incorporate the write downs that we saw in March. Private equity has a long-term investment horizon and investors should think of PIP in the same way. As you can see in the table, the NAV per share growth, which is stated net of fees, has outperformed the public market benchmarks that we use over multiple periods. Since it was formed over 33 years ago, PIP has delivered average net asset value growth of 11.6% a year. The share price was caught up in the public market volatility, which we saw in March, but it has recovered somewhat since then. And equally, over the long term, it has outperformed and delivered double digit returns. PIP has continued to be a top rated fund and we believe that this is due to the access that it has to some of the best private equity managers globally. I will now hand over to Helen to talk a bit more about those managers and the private equity market. Hello everyone. Thank you Vicky. You're probably well aware of the headlines, both good and bad, that private equity attracts. On the one hand, public markets are shrinking in terms of the number of publicly quoted companies globally. On the other hand, commentators worry about the expansion in private markets. They're concerned that there's too much money chasing too few deals. I'm going to discuss this topic, the state of the private equity industry, and the challenges and the opportunities ahead, with particular reference to COVID-19 and the response of the industry. First of all, let's take a look at where the private equity industry was at the end of 2019. In summary, the industry was in robust health. And this slide gives a snapshot with the key statistics. First of all, fundraising on the top right hand side was at a healthy level in terms of value, similar to levels in 2018 and 2017, albeit with fewer funds having raised capital in 2019. Global investment activity was also at a healthy level. On the top left hand side, you can see the activity level, which has hovered at more or less the same level for the last five years, although entry prices had surged somewhat in the last two years. 
Realisations not shown on this slide actually had been strong for several years as managers took advantage of the healthy exit market with high valuations, acquisitive buyers and supportive debt markets. And the final quadrant on the right hand side at the bottom shows the net debt to EBITDA level which was still relatively high as managers took advantage of, of fairly loose credit conditions. But managers were preparing themselves for the downturn which they thought would come given the length of the bull market. Nobody knew what the trigger would be and certainly no one expected that trigger would be a global pandemic. However, I think it's important to note that the private equity managers had been readying their portfolios and their own firms for a considerable period of time. First of all, they rushed to fundraise while times were good and they'd amassed significant war chests. They'd taken advantage of strong exit conditions to prune their portfolios selling portfolio companies. Crucially, they'd invested in their own firms, adding extensive sector expertise, not only in the investment teams, but also increasing the number of people in their portfolio management teams, adding supply chain and procurement experts, digital marketing expertise, and critically, capital markets teams. And using this internal expertise, they'd improve the portfolio company's financial positions, They'd strengthened capital structures through refinancings. They'd lowered financial costs and they pushed out maturities. It's also important to note that they've been preparing extreme downside cases, stress testing their models and taking them through what they thought could be difficult recession scenarios. And finally, they've been investing in more defensive businesses with multiple levers for value creation, not relying on multiple expansion upon exit because they were worried that the exit conditions might not continue, but of opportunities to expand companies through both organic and acquisitive strategies. So overall, at the end of 2019, the private equity market was in a strong position, but we sensed that our managers were preparing themselves for more difficult times ahead. Now let's wind the clock on and examine the impact of COVID-19 on private equity. It's important to note that our private equity managers took rapid action with their portfolio companies from the onset of the crisis. And this is one of the advantages of private equity. It's a sharp attention to detail, heightened governance, and the nimbleness and flexibility that private equity can bring to bear. The managers spent more time with portfolio company management, they refocused board agendas, they constituted crisis committees, sharpened their KPIs, and shared best practice across the portfolio. They then triaged their portfolios, classifying their companies into low, medium, and high impact categories. And there was an immediate focus on three critical areas. First of all, workforce, health, and safety, focusing on staff and portfolio companies, and also within their own firms. And there they encouraged remote working where possible. They focused on preventative health, containment of cases, and when it was safe to do so, return to the sites and offices and deconfinement. Secondly, in terms of preserving liquidity and tightened cash management, the private equity managers had a sharp focus on this, securing funding, uh, cutting non-essential spends, rationalizing inventory, optimizing collections and stress testing their cash flow models. They were able to obtain covenant waivers, extend maturities, and if necessary, provide equity infusions to companies. Thirdly, in terms of operational management, all the investment the private equity managers had made in their staff paid off during this period. They were able to supply experts to help with supply chain issues and procurement, help with managing key customer relationships and, and demand, and then they supplied experts that could help companies move more rapidly to online using digital tools. When it came to assessing valuations for Q1 2020, managers took account of the downdraft in public market comparables in the period, and they wrote down their portfolios. The average write-down was in the high single digits, although the range was large, with some companies in sectors that were particularly affected by the impact of the crisis being written down by 20%, and others seeing little movement. At the end of the first quarter of this year, private equity managers were still working through the immediate impact of COVID-19 and focusing all their attention on the needs of their portfolio companies. As a consequence, with the bandwidth of their teams fully deployed on the existing portfolio, new deals took a back seat and investment activity slowed down. 
In addition, exit processes were delayed as managers felt no need to rush to divest companies, especially if they thought they would run the risk of having to compromise on the value achieved at exit. I would now like to turn to the essential topic of responsible investing in the context of COVID-19. First of all, it's important to say that we've been impressed through our discussions with our managers, how swiftly they reacted to the essential elements of responsible investing during this crisis, protecting both people and portfolios. In addition, both the managers and their portfolio companies have become involved in the COVID-19 relief effort, either directly because of their operating activities, for example, developing vaccines, testing kits and treatments, or indirectly by donating equipment and services. And the private equity managers themselves have donated tens of millions of pounds, euros and dollars to support local communities and the families of portfolio company employees and staff. This response of our private equity managers has been especially pleasing for PIP's manager Pantheon, which is recognized as a leader in responsible investing. Pantheon was an early signatory to the UNPRI and has recently been awarded an A plus for private equity in common with previous years. As you may be aware, Pantheon not only incorporates ESG into its due diligence processes, but also closely monitors the portfolio using tools such as RepRisk. Pantheon exerts influence on the industry with regard to its ESG stance through working with various trade bodies such as the BBCA, Investor Europe and other associations. And Pantheon sets a good example for the industry with its position on gender and ethnic diversity. Having spoken in some detail about the response of the private equity industry in general and our private equity managers, let's spend a few minutes talking about PIP's investment approach prior to COVID-19 and our response to the crisis. So in the years leading up to the crisis, we'd already been steering the portfolio towards more resilient sectors such as information technology and healthcare. We'd also overweighted the portfolio towards our favoured sectors of mid-market buyouts and growth. And over the two or three years leading up to the crisis, we've been aware of the booming conditions in the market, and we've been employing a tight filter when looking at new investment opportunities. And finally, and crucially, we've taken a very prudent approach to the management of PIP's balance sheet, with a conservative approach to the way we think about undrawn commitments and coverage, and an initiative that was launched to increase the size of the credit facility, which Tanya will go into in more detail later. When we were faced with the COVID-19 crisis, Pantheon instantly recognized that a swift response was necessary. And just as our managers increased their conversations with their portfolio companies, we increased our own regular dialogues with our underlying managers. We carried out a detailed assessment of the immediate impact on PIP's portfolio and reported on this to the board, who along with Pantheon, communicated openly and quickly with shareholders. We also delivered on our commitment to provide investors with regular, transparent and up-to-date information. Following the significant fall in stock markets during March, the board and Pantheon decided to adjust the NAV published in the statements for March and April downwards to reflect the potential impact of COVID-19, basing the adjustments on guidance received from the underlying private equity managers. This guidance, which we obtained from 71% by value of PIP's investment portfolio, proved to be a conservative estimate once the actual quarter end valuations at March 31st were received. In addition to this, we increased our attention on PIP's liquidity position, strengthening the balance sheet for expanding the size of PIP's banking facilities and making sure that the company would be well positioned for the future. And that's over to Tanya to speak more about the composition of PIP's portfolio and the company's positioning. Thanks, Helen. Hi, everyone. I'm going to take you through some portfolio highlights. As Helen has outlined, given Pantheon's tight investment filter, PIP's portfolio emphasis is on those sectors experiencing secular growth, with almost half of the portfolio in IT and healthcare. The technology exposure has actually held up relatively well during the COVID crisis, with a high proportion in software companies serving multiple end user markets. Many actually offer subscription-based services that are business critical and therefore difficult to switch off. And many are also expected to benefit from the seismic shift that we're currently seeing to remote working. Our healthcare exposure really covers a broad range of companies. You've got everything here from healthcare services, such as ophthalmologists, but also innovative pharmaceutical companies to healthcare technology providers, 
which are an increasing subsector given the growing overlap between healthcare and technology. The underlying demand fundamentals in healthcare are strong, bolstered by an aging population in the West and a growing middle class in the emerging markets. Some companies have seen short-term impacts given COVID-induced lockdowns, but the medium to long-term outlook is good. In terms of our consumer exposure, this is relatively diversified in companies with robust consumer demand. So you've got anything from consumer staples to professional services and e-commerce. You've got a very low exposure to the travel and entertainment and industries, which have obviously been particularly hard hit by COVID. Some of the larger companies that we have are in education and food staples, such as ice cream companies, which have seen quite stable demand during the crisis. In terms of themes, we've been even more selective in our investment approach in recent years seeking to invest in companies with multiple growth levers, partnering alongside managers with long-standing track records within their sector domains. We partnered in the year alongside Sinven, which is a strong technology franchise in the co-investment in Jaguar, a global provider of procurement software for over 2,000 large and medium-sized enterprises, connecting them to a network of 4 million suppliers. The company's got a great track record of growth, really high customer retention rates, and a best-in-class reputation. Although in the buy and build sleeve for the strong acquisition pipeline, this investment, like many others, arguably combines all five vectors. The GP's deep sector knowledge has helped originate the deal. They've envisaged improvement to the company's existing operational platform. And at the time of the in initial purchase, they had already conceived a large pipeline of acquisition opportunities. Given its business critical nature, the company is also expected to be recession resilient. Another company that we invested in the year was Frenary, the number two ice cream manufacturer worldwide, producing iconic brands such as Cadbury's Ice Cream and haagen -Dazs. The opportunity came up late last year to partner alongside PAI, who've been invested since July 2013. Existing investors wanted to exit the company, given that the fund was getting towards the end of its life. But PAI saw some large acquisition opportunities that they wanted to capitalize on. Padkin's participation, along with other co-investors, helped unlock a secondary opportunity and the performance, which has historically seen very stable year-on-year -year demand growth, has held up during COVID. And this company is poised even for future growth. With PIP, you're getting access to a portfolio of companies that grow faster than the market, not just this year, but consistently year on year, going back in time for a price represented typically by enterprise value to EBITDA that is in line with the broader market indices. As per the top left-hand chart on this page, PIP's buyout sample was valued at 12.7 times EBITDA. So broadly in line with the MSCI World Index average enterprise value to EBITDA. But as for the bottom left-hand chart during the year, the buyout portfolio again posted double-digit growth EBITDA, achieving 16.9%. The company's seen a high average uplift of 28% realized at exit versus prior year net asset value. And it's important to note that this is across 75% of all distributions that the company received in the year. We did see lower distributions to the bottom right-hand chart in the quarter to May as a result of the COVID-induced reduction in deal flow. But over the year, the distribution rate was still at a respectable level, 17% of opening portfolio value. Indeed, distributions are still coming in uh, at a steady pace. And in July, we saw over 20 million pounds of distributions. If we look at the debt that's used by our managers, which typically to enhance returns, these are at manageable levels across the portfolio, especially for the types of businesses and underlying models in which we're invested. As compared with the last crisis, this time round, our managers are more savvy regarding the use of debt, more disciplined, and have learned the lessons that they and others have experienced during the last crisis. Debt has been freely available with less restrictions and its greater uh, proportion of covenant light, providing maximum flexibility in a downturn. 
Our managers have also developed their capital market teams, uh, even within the smaller and mid-market franchises, and have therefore got a hawk eye on ensuring the best available credit solutions for their underlying portfolio companies. BIP has a well-crafted portfolio diversified across multiple vectors. We've really put in the best ideas across all of Pantheon's private equity platform, whether secondary, co-investment, and primary, in each of which Pantheon has a top-tier franchise. Our focus has been on small mid-buyer, where we expect the greatest growth potential, and half of the portfolio is in the US. This doesn't really change much over time, uh, but the US is the deepest market, throwing up the most opportunities. Uh, and we really seek to take capitalize on opportunities that we see across the globe based upon our decades experience of investing with people on the ground in each of the key continents. PIP continues to have a conservatively positioned balance sheet with 121 million pounds in net available cash balances as at the May year end. This has increased slightly to 122 million pounds as at July. The credit facility was increased in the year to 300 million pounds and remains fully undrawn. This expansion is a great success given the broader market environment and represents a further strengthening of PIP's balance sheet position. As at the year end, the company had very strong coverage of undrawn commitments at 3.6 times, allowing us to be not only defensive, but also capitalize on investment opportunities in a potentially more attractive investment environment in the future. Back over to Helen now to discuss the outlook. Thank you, Tony. So now let's summarize where we are with private equity and take a look at both the near-term and the longer-term outlook for the market. As we've already described in, in the previous part of the presentation, the immediate impact of the COVID-19 crisis was a slowing down of New Deal activity and also of exits as private equity managers focused on their portfolios. We've since seen some follow-on investments to support existing portfolio companies, both for defensive and for acquisitive reasons. We're starting now to see some more near-term investments into companies. Um, these can be more in defensive sectors, and there could be an up uptick in these um, as, we go, as we go forward. Later this year, we're expecting valuations will settle down. It could be easier for private equity managers to price risk, and therefore we would expect activity to start to pick up. And turning to the secondary market, we'll also expect to see an acceleration in deal flow. Overall, we believe that the dislocation created by COVID-19 could actually bring some interesting opportunities. Private equity generally is well-placed to be nimble and flexible and take advantage of these sorts of pricing opportunities and dislocations in markets. Let's take a step back now and look at the growth of the private equity market and some of the reasons for that. First of all, there's no doubt that the private equity market has been growing steadily, both in terms of volume and the number of investment opportunities. At the end of 2019, private equity assets under management were over $4.5 trillion, which sounds like a lot of money, but let's put it in perspective. In comparison with listed markets, this is still small. In fact, even in the most sophisticated private equity market in the world, the USA, private equity only accounts for around 1.5% of GDP, whereas public market cap to GDP stands at over 150%. So the market is still relatively small, but the opportunity set for private equity is increasing, and the numbers on this chart prove the point. You can see that over the past 10 years, the number of publicly quoted companies, the dark blue line, has been shrinking by about 2% per annum, while the number of private companies in light blue has been growing by around 8% per annum. Why is this happening? Well, there's a variety of factors. But the main one is that many fast-growing companies are making the choice to IPO later or even deciding not to go public at all since they can raise capital in private markets, which can be seen as more desirable for many reasons. Also, they're more public to privates are carrying as private equity takes companies off the market. And finally, public companies may merge, which again reduces the number of quoted firms. The net result is that the universe of public companies is becoming smaller comprising generally larger, older, and more slower growing businesses. Nowadays, the high growth phase of many exciting businesses is happening in private markets. 
And the reality is that if investors want to have access to faster growing, younger and potentially more innovative companies in exciting sectors such as software and healthcare, they need private equity in their portfolio. So it's clear that private equity has been expanding in terms of its size and the number of opportunities. But why do we think that investors will continue to pour money into the sector? Well, it's clear from this chart on the left-hand side that it's the risk-adjusted returns which have been very attractive. This graph shows returns, the median net IRR, versus risk measured by the standard deviation of the net IRR by sub-segment of private equity. The big dark blue dot shows overall private equity with a median return of around 12% versus a standard deviation of around 17%. And then there's a breakdown of the other areas too. On the right-hand side though, you can see one of the issues of private equity. The dispersion of returns is high. In buyouts, for example, top decile returns hover around 30%, the top quartiles at 20%, but the bottom quartile of returns is around 7.5%. So the interquartile range is massive. And it's even worse for venture, which has an interquartile range of around 1,500 basis points. So the message here is that manager selection and indeed deal selection is absolutely critical in private equity and therefore expert selection of the managers and of the deals is absolutely important. We hope that this presentation has shown how attractive private equity can be, bearing in mind that there are challenges in terms of implementing a strategy. However, the question of access to private equity still remains. Generally, institutional investors commit large sums of capital to a portfolio of private equity funds. They lock their capital up for several years and they handle the complexities of managing calls and distributions themselves. But clearly, this is an issue for smaller investors and for those who do not want to lock their capital up for more than a decade. Listed private equity offers a solution to this problem. By buying just one share of an investment trust like PIP, investors can access a ready-made global portfolio of high quality private equity assets. And since the shares are listed and can be bought and sold like any other stock, investors have liquidity and are able to participate in this exciting market without experiencing some of the typical barriers to entry. KIP offers a high quality, globally diversified private equity portfolio and a liquid solution to the challenge of access in this exciting asset class. And PIP offers long-term performance over multiple different time periods with 11.6% annualized NAB growth since inception in 1987. PIP offers a balanced and globally diversified portfolio for investors and it's a cost-effective and liquid solution to investors' private equity needs. And importantly, PIP is managed by Pantheon with its impeccable responsible investing credentials. Thank you to everybody for attention today. It's been a pleasure speaking to you, and I'd like to hand over to Vicky. Thank you. Thank you, Helen and Tanu. We will now move on to Q&A. Just to remind everybody, if you would like to ask a question, you can do so by submitting it via the Ask a Question box. We've had some questions come in already, so let's get started. So, Helen, I'll come to you with the first one. Um, obviously, Pantheon and PIP have been around for a few decades. Uh, so, what did Pantheon... Uh, learn in the GSC and what, if anything, is different this time for PIP? That's a, that's a great question. Thank you, Vicky. So um, I think, you know, in the financial crisis, again, we saw um, a risk off um, uh, sort of attitude from investors. Um, the uh, share, share price did decline. It took um, some time to come back. Um, NAV also declined. Um, but I think what's important to say is that when you look back at those particular vintage years, these were actually very good vintages for private equity. And managers that did deploy capital um, were able to take advantage of, of some of the um, opportunities you know, that were created by the dislocation and disruption. Um, so those vintage years are actually quite, quite strong. Um, what, what did we learn in it? I think, um, I think you know, the uh, importance of, of you know, steady deployment, you know, not trying to time the market, I think that's really important. Um, the importance of quality, you know, investing in quality managers and quality uh, deals, um, and you know, making sure that the, the portfolio is well positioned um, going into a crisis, managing through it, and actually, I suppose, crucially for, for PIP, you know, making sure that we have a, a strong balance sheet, um, adequate cash on the balance sheet, and good financing, 
um, and that's you know that's certainly the case um, this time around. Um, and coming to you, Tanu, with the next one, um, what has changed in the portfolio over the last few years? Uh, do you expect the sector exposures to, to change going forward? Um, and perhaps you could highlight uh, some of the sample companies that you use as examples again. Sure, Rishi. Um, the portfolio is diversified across multiple vectors. Year-to-year -year changes tend to be gradual. Uh, for several years now, as we've discussed in the in, in the uh, presentation, we focused on growth throughout the portfolio with an emphasis on uh, mid-market and growth in investments distributed across the globe. Um, in terms of the general approach and strategy that we take, given the strong returns that we've experienced and the resilience that we've seen post the onset of COVID, uh, we do not expect to change strategy um, significantly. So you, you should not expect to see um, significant changes um, by um, sector or by um, other vectors. Uh, in terms of the changes that we've seen over time, uh, co-investments have increased from around 20% of the portfolio a few years ago to 35% of the portfolio as at the year end. Given the expanding opportunity set and really attractive um, underlying uh, fundamentals we're seeing, this, along with our primary commitments, have helped rejuvenate the portfolio, which is therefore on average come down from a, you know, age wise from over seven years uh, to 5.1 years as at the year end sector wise um, previously consumer exposure was at the top um, we've been focused in recent years on uh, a smaller subset of consumer companies with resilient and durable demand and strong growth prospects typically operating in uh, sectors with secular growth. So that has come down slightly. Uh, and now uh, information technology and the healthcare are the largest sectors reflecting the, the really attractive nature of the opportunity that set that we're seeing, seeing and the underlying growth trends. Right. And, and staying with you, Tanu, um, when would you expect the uh, exit environment to start to look attractive? So exits in the broader market have um, slowed down somewhat given the impact of COVID-19 um, and all, we have seen a moderation of exits within PIP's portfolio as well um, and a moderation of distributions. Uh, but this um, I'll emphasize is in contrast with the very full activity levels that we've seen in recent years. Um, more recently, Post the onset of COVID, we're still seeing distributions come in on a monthly basis. Um, so we saw 12 million pounds, for example, in June and 20 million pounds worth of distributions in July. So um, looking forward, uh, the distribution level may be slightly muted until activity fully recovers uh, to pre-COVID levels. Um, but whatever the exit environment, PIP is really well placed uh, with a strong balance sheet. Uh, and we're actively committing to new opportunities uh, and taking advantage and capitalizing on the attractive pipeline of new deals uh, that Pantheon has originated. Um, and we've had a question here about um, calls, so I'll come to you again, Tanu, to on that one. So uh, what do you expect in terms of capital calls going forward? Yeah, sure. Um, similarly, given the um, reduction and moderation in broader activity, uh, within the private equity sector, and um, we are seeing um, calls um, slightly uh, moderate. Um, in fact, um, we didn't see the rush or increase in calls that was initially expected um, immediately after the onset of COVID. Um, and if you look um, going forward, we'd expect to see calls um, average around the 20% the level, so that's 20% um, in call rates, which are um, effectively the level of calls versus opening undrawn commitments. So I think going forward, where as we see exits, uh, if we see exits continue to be moderated, we'd also expect a concomitant 
moderation uh, of call levels from the portfolio. Thank you. Uh, we've had a question uh, on the discount, uh, so I can probably take that one. Um, how do you explain this discount to NAV in May 2020? Um, so the share price was caught up in the wider market volatility, and it's uh, true that the, the discount did widen. Um, the share price has recovered somewhat since then, so um, we are um, picked now uh, at about a 20% discount, um, which is pretty much in line with the wider, wider sector. Um, we think the discount is, is unjustified, um, especially considering the, you know, the quality of the, the underlying portfolio um, and also the, you know, the, um, the uplift on exit that, that was achieved during, during the year with a 28%. Um, we are working hard on, on our marketing um, and uh, you know, trying to get the story out to, to a wider um, broad base of, of investors. Uh, uh, and as I say, you know, we, we, we don't think that discount should be there. Um, I think it's fair to say that the discount has come back in quicker uh, than what we saw in the last um, financial crisis, which, which is encouraging. So we've had a question on the energy exposure. So I'll come to you with that one, Helen. Um, your annual report shows that you have 5% in the energy sector. Can you remind us why this investment was made and what you expect to happen to the position, please? Yeah, thanks, Vicky. Um, so the 5% in the energy uh, sector has actually come down over time. It was slightly um, higher, in fact, last, last year. Um, why was the investment made? We've, we've actually made good money in the energy sector um, over, over previous um, time periods. Uh, you know, we were obviously badly hit by the downdraft in energy prices in the first quarter of this year. Um, and in fact, I think at one point, energy prices actually went zero. So that obviously had a sort of a sector-wide um, effect. Um, as to um, where we expect um, things to go in the future, I think we remarked in, in the report, in the annual report, actually, that we would expect to see this exposure go, go down over time. And it's important to say that, you know, we, as, as Tammy mentioned, we've got a, a very well-diversified portfolio. We've got um, a, a number of interesting sectors. We've been growing um, the IT and healthcare sectors over time, and really the expense of consumer sectors. And you know we continue to see good um, good opportunities in in those sectors, which tend to be um, you know more resilient, more growth orientated, um, and where we've got specialist managers actually as well. We've had a question um, about technology. Uh, we hear a lot hmm. about the tech unicorns in the US and China. Uh, how successful has Europe been in this regard, and what exposure has PIP had to to such companies? Uh, so I'll come back to you with that one, Helen. Yeah, it's interesting. I, mean, I think it's you know the US that gets all the gets all the attention on this, but actually um, Europe has actually been producing um, some some really interesting companies, particularly in areas such as as fintech, um, which is a real area of strength for um, for, for European venture. Um, over the last couple of years, actually, the, the number of unicorns produced in Europe has actually doubled. Um, I think um, since sort of 2012 2013, um, there's been around about 75. Um, European unicorns, which may surprise people, um, and those have included companies such as um, Spotify, you know, Revolut, Farfetch, um, so some brand names that people would, you know, should have thought about, um, would have thought about. So um, we think actually the conditions in Europe are, are good for the creation of these these interesting tech companies. Um, they tend to be somewhat um, cheaper. Um, and you know, cheaper to build than in the US. There's less competition, there are fewer, fewer, fewer um, VC competitors actually. And we're an investor with some of the leading managers um, who've been responsible for creating um, actually the majority of, of, of unicorns. So Pip will continue to have the opportunity to participate in these, these sorts of exciting businesses. Um, so we've had a few um, more about the, the crisis, so I shall come back to you with this one, Helen. Um, are there any examples of changes or recommendations that you made to the managers as a result of the enhanced engagement during the crisis? I think it's, it's important to say that we've been, we've been really impressed, actually, by the response of, of our managers during the crisis. I think um, almost without exception, um, they took very fast action with portfolio companies, with the with the staff, you know, as I mentioned in, in, in the webinar, really, you know, focusing on what was what was important in terms of the people and then the health of the companies as well. Um, you know, as as the dust uh, settled, 
we will certainly be, you know, looking at, you know, what different managers did, how their portfolios have fared. Um, you know, typically we make continuous changes to the portfolios. So um, every time we make a new commitment to a fund, we're, we're you know, redoing our due diligence. We're re-underwriting it. Every time we do a, do a co-investment, we're looking at the track record of the, of the manager. So, um, you know, I think periods of stress really um, serve to help uh, highlight both the, um, the good points and, and maybe the points of improvement for managers. So, as you know, going forward, we will definitely pick out some of these, um, you know, some of these points. But I can't, I can't really think of a manager off the top of my head that we've been, you know, particularly disappointed with. I think, you know, across the board, they've, they've, they've actually risen to the occasion. Right. And turning now to the secondary market, uh, so I'll come to you with this question, Tanu. Um, what kind of deals do you expect to see in the secondary market? Are there likely to be a lot of forced sellers? Sure. So um, after the initial hiatus in deal flow post the onset of COVID, we are starting to see a recovery in, in the secondary deal flow. Uh, what's, what um, sellers and buyers are getting more comfortable um, with valuations, and um, we're actually seeing some portfolio sellers coming into the market to look and actually trim at the edges to tidy up their holdings. We're also at the same time seeing a huge increase in what we call manager-led secondaries, uh, where a manager will, will look to unlock growth in an individual company or a group of companies that are held in funds that are coming to the end of their fund life. Um, and this particular part of the market is now growing, so um, around a third of the overall secondary market. Um, and post-COVID, post given the delays in, in, in some of the exit uh, processes, uh, some of the deal flow that we're seeing is of the highest quality with some really high quality managers. Um, and an example that we did before, which um, I did want to answer one of the folks' questions around the companies that we discussed, um, one of an example of a secondary um, uh, manager uh, led secondary is Bronary, which is the number two ice cream manufacturer worldwide, which we invested where we invested alongside PAI uh, in this great, fantastic opportunity. Um, the other company that we discussed was Jaguar, which is a co investment that we made alongside Sinven. Uh, in a global provider of procurement software. So I think we are almost out of time, but we've probably got time for one more question, um, and it's an ESG-related question, so I shall come to you with that one, Helen. Um, as a fund investor, what influence can you really have on the behaviour of your underlying managers and their portfolio companies? Um, so I, I think people will always think that you know, because private equity is private, um, you know, you're, you're not able to get information and you're not able to, um, you know, really hold the, the, the managers to task. I, I don't think things could be further from the truth, actually. We get access, um, you know, to, to the fund managers, to the underlying deal teams. Um, we get access to them during the due diligence process. But, you know, crucially, as we're, as we're managing the, the portfolio, um, and I think that this crisis has shown that we've been able to extract a great deal of information, actually, um, from the managers, not just on, on valuations, but also on behavior and what they've done with the portfolio companies. Um, so, you know, we really hold these, these managers to task. Um, we, we use this tool called RepRisk, which I mentioned during the, um, during the webinar, um, which highlights um, uh, any any sort of ESG incidents um, that occur in the portfolio during the year, and it does this through artificial intelligence by basically scouring news reports in any language in any country across the world for any mention of one of our portfolio companies um, that you know that might have um, breached one of the you know either the E, the S, or the G. Um, we then you know use this as a as a prompt to um, to speak with our with our portfolio managers. Um, we have very few incidents, actually, first of all, um, per, per year. When we do have the incidents, you know, we talk to the managers. Um, it's very rare indeed that they're not aware of what's going on and they haven't taken some, some action. Um, so I think that's a, that's a good example of how we, how we engage with them. I would say as well that, you know, as we, as we mentioned in, in, you know, during the slide, slideshow, um, managers have really upped um, their internal 
expertise on, on things like sort of you know op operating expertise but they've, they've also upped their ESG um, expertise too so many of the managers actually have somebody dedicated full-time to looking at responsible investing they make sure that that's incorporated um, into their own due diligence processes with the manager and into their into their portfolio monitoring and I would say that's actually been one of the big changes over the last 10 years is this focus on on ESG and why are they doing it I think you know it's not just because it's doing the right thing although that you know that is you know, doing the right thing and they're conscious of, of reputation, um, but also because it's it's been proven that you know, having a good attitude to ESG and responsible investing actually makes you a better investor and enhances value in the portfolio companies. So the smartest investors on the globe now are um, really focusing on responsible investing. Great. Um, well, I think we are probably out of time, so we'll wrap it there. Um, thank you to everyone for joining us today and for your questions. Uh, apologies to those people whose questions we didn't get to. Uh, we will follow up with you after this session. Um, if you would like to learn more about PIP, you will find a lot of information on the website, uh, or indeed do, do please get in touch with us. Thank you again and goodbye.